Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day three of our coverage of the Danube, uh, where we are talking about all the beautiful things you can see on a river cruise from the Danube. I'm joined again today, as usual, by my co-conspirator, Reed Cohen. Guten Morgen. Good Morgen, wie geht's alles? <laughs> you can tell I speak German really well. <laughs> Of all the languages, that's the one I speak the least. Um, so, but that's great because that means that today Reed is going to be able to teach me something that I don't know because we're going to be speaking about Vienna today. And our guest today is Gerhard, who's coming to us from uh, Vienna. Uh, guten Morgen, also to you. Or no, it's not. It's yeah, good I, I rather I rather say good night now. No, no, it's it's <laughs> good evening already huh? because it's seven o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, <laughs> from hot Vienna, you told us that it's really hot there today. Yeah, it's summer, summer. Uh, yeah. So um, one of the things that we're doing, uh, if you haven't seen any of the, the content we've done this week, is that um, Reed and I have decided to team up next year for something very different for me, at least, which is a riverboat cruise. Kind of like if you've seen those Viking cruises, it's something sort of like that, where we're going to be doing a cruise along the Danube River. So you unpack once, you stay on the river cruise the whole time. We're going to see uh, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, and a few other things along the way pretty relaxing, chill way to do things. And especially if, if you are a traveler who maybe has some mobility issues, <laughs> nice cat. Uh, it's, it's a great way to travel. Uh, so this is something we're gonna try that's new to me and we're gonna be doing that next September. So if you're interested in um, checking that out, you can find it on imprinttours.com. And that's where we're taking bookings right now for next year. We already have some people booking, haven't we had read? Yeah, I think we've got uh, four cabins sold already, but we've got lots. We've got 20 cabins, so sign up. Yep, it's going to be lots of fun. Um, so I don't really know much about Vienna, just to be honest with you guys. I, last time I was in Vienna, I was practically a teenager. I went in my backpacking days uh, and stayed in Vienna, as one does uh, when you're in your 20s and you're wandering around Europe, and absolutely loved it, especially with my architecture background as an architect. I loved all of the beautiful architecture, the Jugendstil architecture, Art Nouveau, such an interesting city. Um, so tell us a little bit about our guest today, Reed. Well, this is Gerhard. He's our main man in Vienna for, uh, for imprint tours, but also a, a veteran of many, many Rick Steves uh, tours that go through Vienna. So he's, we've known him for many, many years. Uh, and he's our local expert. And uh, so he's coming, from, coming to us from Vienna. Uh, and Gerhard, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this over to you right away. Um, we we're just this think of this as uh, Vienna 101 for our viewers. And uh, uh, why should people why should people come to Vienna if they've never been there before? Let's start with that. Yeah, because I just talked with you before because it's long summers. For example, if you like warm weather, then come maybe in June to Vienna. If you like hot weather, then come in uh, July August. If you like decent weather, come in September. When is your boat? When is your boat uh, excursion? What, what uh, month? It's, we start September 20th. Uh, so we'll be with you in Vienna around the 25th, 26th of September. I think it's a perfect time to be in Vienna myself. That's the best time, actually. That's the best time. Our, yeah, our, Vienna, I, for, what can I tell you? It was a long time ago. It was the capital of a huge multinational empire. But... Uh, the good old dictators lost the First World War and then uh, left over German speaking territory of this empire, uh, suddenly got a capital, uh, which is Vienna, which was actually designed to be the capital of a huge empire. So that, that means you have a lot of great buildings, which you rather expect in cities like Paris or whatever. You have great collections and you rather expect, expect in cities like Paris and so on, because of the ruling elite, because of the uh, aristocracy uh, they had all the money in the world and they've been collecting and a lot of this stuff is still here in the city so it's it's amazing uh, that they're not rather unimportant uh, town uh, otherwise uh, which when uh, honestly Austria has I think nine and a half million people uh, Vienna has two million and yeah but because of its past uh, it has enormous potential it has really a lot of culture a lot I'm talking about several several high class museums, for example, and and great palaces and bar gardens and all the kind of things. So if one likes that, Vienna still is a great place for it. And it's, in my opinion, a good thing is it's not so widespread. It's all quite together in the center. 
So yeah. that makes it, uh, for me, for, for example, as a guide attractive and for the tourism too, because they don't have to walk these long distances on to see a lot, for example. Have you, have do you have you, a more precise question? Well, you, you've, you've touched on something that um, I think is important because anytime I take a group of people to a new place, I try to sort of encapsulate the sense of a place in, in sort of one phrase or one word or one sentence. And that's easy for me with Vienna because I say this is imperial, right? That's my one word description of Vienna. You've done a really good job of filling in that background with that. The Habsburgs having their seat of power there in Vienna, this was the, the capital of a huge, huge sprawling empire for centuries and centuries. Now it's not such an important big city, but you've got that historic core and all the leftovers, all the trappings of empire. Um, so architecturally, art-wise, I mean, the, uh, the treasury there at the Hofburg Palace has all the great uh, imperial treasures of the Habsburg uh, dynasty. So imperial is a really good uh, one word description, I think, of Vienna. Um, so, okay, um, you mentioned uh, great museums. Um, name two or three of the, what you would say are the top museums for people to visit when they come to Vienna. I, I know I have my list, but what, what is yours? Yeah, maybe the Albertina, if you like international art from the 1880s till then, till, till the 1920s. Huh? I mean, uh, high quality. Uh, all of them, all of this, from Delacroix, Monet, Monet, um, Monet down to Picasso, all represented with good work and very good descriptions. Uh, this, is, this is a, a high-class museum. Uh, a, a very good museum is, of course, the Museum of Fine Arts. But that's uh, uh, Rennes, the, the Renaissance in painting. Uh, sorry, the Renaissance and Baroque painting collection of the Habsburgs. So if you're not so much interested in the Renaissance and Baroque, still great because they built a building in the 1880s around their huge painting collection. This is something absolutely unique, was never done in the world before, for sure, I mean, for sure not in this scale and not in the late 19th century. So that's something, there's a huge palace dedicated to uh, art which the Habsburgs collected, the whole house corresponds with what's integrated in, in, in masterpieces. It's, it's something very, very special. So, and money, you feel these people, uh, maybe they had any troubles, but not money-wise. And money was not the problem for them, it seems. Yeah, um, uh, in, intermarriage yeah, might have been, might be a problem that you could mention about the Habsburgs. They wanted to keep all that money in one family. And so after a few generations, they started to have some, uh, uh, some things that show up in the, in the portraits that uh, are not so pleasant. So uh, they, they paid a price at, uh, at some point, yeah. you know, they paid not um, only the price. They, they, don't, they didn't pay only the price with quite, quite, a, as you say, ugliness, but they also, uh, lost uh, the, 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 the dynasty yeah? because Maria Theresia's father, in reality, was the last of the male Habsburgs. Maria Theresia, after cheated, she named the dynasty after after uh, herself, yeah? but which is not politically correct. But the Habsburgs faded away already in the year 1740, if we be honest, mm -hmm. because of this disgusting marriage policy. Only cousin first degree. This is for a Catholic dynasty, yeah? let's say for an ultra Catholic dynasty. It's, it's, I mean, this is not neat huh? because it was strictly prohibited for the ordinary folks to do that since the 14th century. But the Habsburgs had to pay, as you say, a, a, a high price for that. Huh? The, yeah. We don't do it in farming. Maybe read, you know that in farming, we do not cross animals first degree for a certain reason. And humans did it huh? because of greed, power. Well, Certainly the Habsburgs had no corner on greed and the pursuit of power when it comes to European history, but, but yeah, absolutely true about that dynasty. Um, so um, something else, I, I don't want to divert us too much here. I mean, it's such a, such a fascinating history and, and um, that you mentioned that they were a Catholic dynasty. I think that's maybe something important for our viewers to know that when it came to the great religious wars of the 17th century and even before, right, once the, once the Protestants had sort of tried to split away from the Catholic Church and then people started killing each other over religion, Christian against Christian, 
The Habsburgs were the great standard bearers for the Catholic Church. They were the champions of the Catholic Church in all those wars. And that's that's where the great slide truly began of, of them starting to lose power was uh, the devastating effects that the that those religious wars had um, on the Habsburgs. So that's that's all part of that story as well, right? Going the Thirty Years' War, of course, being the worst of it in the first half of the 17th century. But the Thirty Years' War, you know, started in Prague, but it was a it was a Habsburg squabble. So um, there you have it. Um, okay, let's uh, let's let's leave let's leave history a little bit. The other thing that I think of just sort of that sort of one word description of Vienna is music. Uh, uh, Vienna is a city of music, you know, the great opera house there, the Habsburgs were, the Habsburgs were to uh, classical music, what the uh, uh, the Medici's were to the visual arts, you know, in, in Italy. So the Habsburgs were the great patrons of Mozart and, and the Haydn's and uh, Beethoven and, you know, your uh, list off your favorite composers. They were patronized by the Habsburgs. Um, give us your perspective on the musical side of Vienna and those people who, for whom that's a really important element of their travels. What what things would you recommend that they see and do and experience in Vienna to touch on that that musical side of the culture? Yeah, as I say, Reed, uh, it's uh, they went for the they did not go for the applied arts, not at all. So applied arts developed in Italy, in France, in in Spain, wherever, coming late to Vienna, coming often fifty or hundred years after it was developed in other countries, but not the music. The Habsburgs really pumped. The millions into the fields of music already in the seventh in the early 17th century. Vienna had concert halls. Vienna had had fixed or orchestras, so musicians could uh, rent a, a whole orchestra. Another territory of the world, very difficult. You had to uh, you had to find musicians, high class musicians, and so on. And then, uh, so great concert halls, great academies with very famous teachers. And that, of course, attracted the, the upcoming uh, elite of, of, of musicians internationally. Because what you did not really mention, most of our so-called Viennese musicians are not born here. They are, they are born somewhere else. So they, are, they have been living here. They have been working here. They have been dying here. But for, from Vienna, for sure, not, Beethoven, not Beethoven is not Mozart, is not Haydn, is not, not Brahms, whatever. Very few, maybe Schubert, or maybe the Strauss dynasty, but uh, most from abroad, which shows uh, Vienna was a magnet. Of course, Paris was a magnet. Paris had that partly too. So often these great music stars, you know, they're chosen. Some like Chopin, for example, few months in Vienna, few months in Paris, coming back a few months to Vienna, and then knowing Paris is the, the great, the great place from another way around. So. That is the reason Vienna was because they pumped the, the big money into the field. They didn't like the musicians personally, but the outcome. So they they really went for that. And yeah, and that's the reason we have so, much, so many, today, so many great sites. We have, for example, this Musikverein in Vienna. That's the home of the Vienna Philharmonics. So still still a world class orchestra in a, in a in a world-class uh, concert hall, one of the most famous concert halls uh, on the planet, actually. So, and 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 as I mentioned, the Opera House. So the I main the Opera House did not really survive World War II so well. Huh? Maybe only fifteen percent of the building is really from the old days. But op Opera House in Vienna does unique things which other opera houses in the world don't do. Uh, they they have excellent own own ensemble, own stuff. But uh, they have, for example, 53 different productions a year. No other opera house in the world runs it like that. I mean, I don't know if it's necessary, yeah, but Vienna does it. It has never on two evenings the same performance. Is that a necessity? I don't know. I would say no, but uh, I would rather do like the Metropolitan does it. Uh, maybe three nights the same uh, performance and switch to another one. Huh? No, Vienna every night another one. So, and this uh, I'm talking about two, so we have two more opera houses in Vienna than the, than the famous one on the ring. There's a lot of uh, concerts every night in Vienna. So Vienna, but also we have to admit, to, Vienna is also a place where uh, the, the, the new music is going to, or maybe the, for sure, uh, in, in any uh, aspects, uh, electronic music, also rock music, 
I mean, not developed in Vienna, but these famous musicians of, 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 of this periods coming to Vienna still. You know? So Vienna has every year about 20 or 30 of these world-class stars in, in, in either in football stadiums or in concert halls and so on. So Vienna, in Vienna, actually a lot is going on. If you, for example, read in the news, look, look it up in the internet, look up Vienna events, for example, then you find a lot. Then you, you see every night, uh, there's at least uh, 10, 15 possibilities of what you could do, except uh, instead of eating, maybe in the evening, uh, maybe uh, to go out uh, to see something very special, something very unique. Uh, so it's amazing that uh, a small city like Vienna uh, has so much. Of course, we have to admit also Vienna is a very wealthy city. Yeah? So Vienna is not that, that expensive. Huh? It's, it's like uh, price-wise now, like most of the other European cities, not as expensive as London, for sure not. Half price London, but otherwise like, like the other cities, huh? maybe a bit like Paris, kind of. So um, I think it's a, a lot of reasons yeah, to visit Vienna for a few days. I know people, they, they go to Vienna for, for four, five, six days and, and go for, to the main, for the main collections, for the main things to see for the eye, like the Baroque gardens uh, of the summer palaces of the former ruling elite and so on. So Vienna is a great place. And if you do not want to spend much money, then you buy yourself a bus ticket and or, or a public transport ticket for a day, I think it costs six euros, and then take like a bus which brings you from the city center up to the Vienna woods and you can look down over the, uh, uh, under the vineyards, you see, you see then uh, the city, right? or you can go with the metro to Schönbrunn Palace. You just go around the palace, don't go in, just be impressed by these enormous gardens and so on. Vienna, you can do a lot, a lot, and, you can blow the money, you can really uh, save it also. You don't have to, you, have, you, you can see culture, which I love, for example, for little money. So, you Gerhard, I have a question for you. Um, I know that you run a museum called the Third Man Museum, but I'd love to hear about that because we even have gotten comments from people watching uh, this broadcast that say they love your museum. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Yes, uh, this is, uh, it came by the way, because I'm, I'm actually on and off a tour guide. I'm doing uh, this and this and this and that. Uh, but uh, in the mid-1990s, I had a lot of British, a lot of Americans with me, and often they asked me about this movie, The Third Man. And I always had to say, sorry, I'm from Vienna. This movie here never had a high standing. Huh? People didn't want to see that. Huh? People didn't want to see the reality after World War II, huh? because the main star of the movie, The Third Man, which was a British-American production, was Vienna after the war. And in Vienna, uh, as much as I love Vienna, I have, uh, as, as, as much I hate the fact that Vienna did not learn anything out of World War II. In Vienna, we had the disaster happening, the, the, the real disaster. Vienna was not only fascism and, and so on, that was before. But then in, uh, during the Second World War, what happened here is so unbelievable and it's a total denial here. People. Austria was declared being the first victim of Hitler, and now all these uh, people say that we are victims, we are victims, we don't, uh, uh, there was no education, Edu no education for two generations after World War II on, on, on what happened uh, in, the, in the World War II. And I thought, why not via a movie? Why not via a movie? Use it as a, as an, a window, as a door, in, a door entrance into something which is completely unsolved here in this city. And uh, the only misfortune I have made my museum, I love it very much, and I meet a lot of great and, and interesting people and whatever, is that no locals are coming. Locals do not like, this, this is, the movies, the, the movie, they say, oh, no, no, I know it all, I know it all, leave me alone with it. And that's usually that. Not because people are bad, but the people have might be not, never confrontated. And, and you don't wanna talk about, I understand that in no country of the world do you wanna talk about terrible things you did. So you want to glorify, I mean, you know, we've been talking about, yeah, as I said before, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, fantastic collections. Of, uh, uh, I, I, I just mentioned two, uh, but there's many more. There's, for example, the Leopold Foundation. This is the highest class museum. And they have, have the Belvedere. Belvedere is, okay. this is all a bit over the top, but there is a dark shadow somewhere sitting still on Vienna, which we Viennese people do not really know about. And this is, it's my personal thing. I, 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 I'm so lucky. I'm, I crawled out of my mother's womb 
uh, in, 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 in a great place in the world, uh, and uh, it could have been Syria or whatever. Uh, I have all the possibilities. I love to work, and I can, tr I could travel. I could do anything I wanted, you know, because because when you really like to work, uh, uh, the world is open in, in a Western city like Vienna. And a little education, come on, this is nothing. This is nothing dramatic. Uh, and uh, I have a very, I have a very good life. I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm, I'm rather poor because uh, this museum and the collection and everything was so extremely expensive and I, have, I blew it all, but my wife didn't mind. She, she said, split bank accounts and, and, and do what you want. So that was very nice of her. So we split the bank account in the, in the year 1997 and then I blew it all. But uh, it's a great place. It's a great museum. And I never thought that I can get a, a world-class collection like that together as a human, a single human being. So I'm very happy uh, and... Uh, People, people love it. People love, love the museum. Could you describe a little bit for us, Gerhard, about the museum? Because I've never been. So, um, what what is in the museum? How do you how do you show people? Because it's, I mean, it sounds like what it is is it's a museum of post -war, World War II Vienna, where it's, no, it's first of all it's, people about the first war. Of all, so, yeah. First of all, it's a, a, a movie. It's it's a it's a film museum. It's a, it's a great collection around the movie The Third Man. Oh, okay. I was very lucky. There was this generation gap, the second generation after uh, they shot the movie in 1948 in Vienna, in the ruins. And uh, a lot came back to the markets, the collector's diets, arch archive had, got, had been shifted in the United States and in, in, in Great Britain. And I, I had to have a good network and I was always, uh, yeah, I was lucky too. Huh? But uh, people also wanted to, that I, I, I buy the things huh? because people said, this is a fantastic thing that you, uh, don't make only a, a movie museum, but go down, go into that field. Because the third man uh, is not a, 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 a nice movie, not a, it's not. Yeah. It, it, it goes deep down into the intestines of the city. But it must have had, had a reason. Huh? The British, the Americans, the, the, the Soviets huh, have been not really fond of uh, Austria and of Vienna after World War II. So, and, for me, this is exciting that I can get over, uh, over a, a very good, I would say, extremely good movie collection, uh, which is unique in the world. There's no other museum in the world which deals with one movie only, but not only a little script and a little maybe cameras and so on. It, we display about 2,000 items which deal with the movie directly and about 1,200 items which deal with the main star of the movie, Vienna after the war, and also pre-war, because I don't want to bug in uh, with all this, uh, but you can also touch via the movie, the pre-war time. I didn't have to do research. There was a lot, a lot written about, because there's a lot of reality and a lot of fiction in this movie. Uh, uh, Graham Greene, uh, the famous British author, he packed a lot of informations uh, in, in and... Uh, it's very, it's it, it you can go deep deep inside uh, this field uh, pre-war post-war if you're interested if not you can also use this museum many people do it they just have fun yeah? they, 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 they so it's, it's actually two museums in one huh? so but one goes together with the other it's so you basically to, taken just a passion of yours and you've turned it into a museum. That's really cool. <laughs> and really bankrolled it your own self. Wow, that's yeah. super that's a real passion. Uh, yeah. If you wanna, if you wanna blow, if you wanna put a lot of money into the sand, then create a third man museum in Vienna. But <laughs> I don't mind about that. I really don't mind. We have no children, so I can blow it. Huh? If you have children, the children go to the police and they say, "My father blows my heritage. Jail him." But uh, <laughs> since we have no kids, this problem I don't have. I can't. Don't, don't give my kids ideas. They'll go to the the police about the amount of <laughs> wine that I like to buy. So. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our things we like spending money on <laughs> or shoes you know mm -hmm. they'll, they'll call the police and say that my mom's spending my inheritance on shoes which is true actually <laughs> so um where did you get your passion what, for world what's, war what's, what's read what's what's reads sins oh How yes does he get we're not going there Gerhard. you've known me too long we're not going there Hmm. All right. oh, I'm going to have to think about that. I bet I know the answer, but it's, yeah, hmm. interesting. <laughs> What's Maya going to call the police about? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so where did your passion for World War II history come from? I mean, was that just something you grew up being interested in, or was it something that you found a curiosity over time to try and explain what's around you, or what? How did that happen? 
I was, uh, when I was very young, uh, I, I quit uh, university. And my, my parents have been not very lucky with me. Uh, they paid for good education and uh, what ca came out of me, a flea circus theory. No, but I was, I was, tra I was traveling uh, very, very much. I was, uh, for about 11 years, I was away from Austria and I uh, uh, had exciting life. Uh, but I met a lot of interesting people and I met uh, uh, once in Bombay, I was, I was stuck uh, two months uh, uh, together with a, uh, an Israeli cameraman, and, and, and this guy was a, 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 a was a little older than me, and he was a great guy, and 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 uh, he found out right away that I'm a typical Austrian. He has no idea what happened in the Second World War, and this was for me painful because today if this would, could would happen if i get a question from somebody uh, about something i never heard about i i i, I quick i could lie i could say i quick go to the loo and then i look in the cell phone in wikipedia what was happening in austria in in world war ii what why what, so but in, i couldn't i said it was really a shame and then when i was living in athens for a couple of years uh i had a very good friend there uh, she she was jewish and her her her, her her mother, she came from a town in Austria, but she fled uh, uh, in time. So she, the, her family did not get murdered. But but uh, this this woman too, uh, she said, how stupid you are, she said, and so on. And even we had been good friends. And I said, it's not my fault. I said, I, mean, I, I had education, but, but not on that. And I felt very bad. So this was uh, several times it happened. But then I learned, and then I learned slowly. And then when I came, to Vienna, uh, back from all of my travels and so on. Then, when I then got this this guide license, uh, I, I really tried uh, to go into a bit into these fields, uh, and I was very lucky, and I met a lot of uh, Americans, which uh, American Jews, which originated, uh, which did come from Vienna, uh, and either alone or uh, as child they survived, or sometimes with the whole family, but. These people, uh, they, they made it. Yeah? They wanted to, on the end of their lives, yeah? they wanted to see once more uh, the, the, the parents got murdered or whatever. And often they came, they, they booked like expensive hotels, uh, uh, expensive travel agencies and, uh, and, and, and with limousines. Yeah? They wanted to see all these locations and so on. And then I learned a lot, a lot, a lot. Because these people, after they, uh, first of all, they had, they had been always very suspicious. I mean, they thought, who are you? Huh? Did the tourist boat bring it to us huh? or whatever? And so on. But then they found that uh, there's no tourist boat behind me and nothing. And uh, I'm a very honest person. I'm, I'm, I'm also, in my heart, I'm a purist. I, I don't like to like, like like to lie around things and and so on and polish up things nicely. Yeah, and then uh, these people gave me fantastic uh, insights into something I could not believe in the beginning, beginning that this could have been happening. Uh, for for example, in a place like Vienna. So this is. So you had no somewhere. education at all as a student about what no. Austria's role no. in World War II was. None. No. It, it's the same in Germany too, though. It's wow. the same in Germany, not right? As, I mean, they're now they're coming around to to mm -hmm. including it in the curriculum, but that was a dark page in their history that they'd rather just pretend didn't happen. So I I don't I can't speak for the Austrian education system as to why the decisions were made or not made, but um, yeah, I, I had to kind of understand why there might be a gap. Yeah, and maybe one one thing, Reid, uh, the American administration, uh, which was very powerful here in Vienna, and then and, and luckily uh, the, they had been on the end also driving the Soviets out of here and so on, but uh, the American administration did not want to have any denazification. They said World War II, we won it. It's 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 over. Uh, now we concentrate of this on, on destroying the communism. That was now the goal. And right. it was and the American administration did not want to have the former Nazis uh, opposing them because they said uh, this famous American general Mark W. Clark, he was here high commissioner for the for a couple of years. And he said it clear. He said if that happens, then we Americans can pack up and and can and can fly home. Because we have no chance, so they will destabilize the country right away. They will shoot military personnel and blow up buildings and poison gas attacks and so on. So, no denazification in Austria. All the beasts, all these leading uh, uh, criminals and so on, they all could escape. All of them. So this was this. Yeah, and nobody wanted to talk about it after. So this is uh, a bit different than Germany. So, but. Yeah, here, this, this country was, was named the first victim of Hitler. Suddenly, the, the aggressors had been the victims. And, in, and, and Germany uh, was not called the victim. Huh? That's, that is a big difference. Huh? So, but unfortunately, yeah, um, my, education is, my education was a good education. Uh, I have to really say my parents did not save money on me. And, uh, but anything we learned, but not uh, 
Now, I learned in history, I became, in, as, as long as I have been uh, educated in, in, in the school system, we came to 1918, the, the fall of the Habsburg dynasty, like nothing would have been happening afterwards. So yeah, just, this is, it wasn't that they, they, they kind of portrayed Austria in an incorrect light, they just literally just didn't talk about it, like World War II never happened. Is that, was that the approach? Yeah, there was a war in Germany uh, that, that, that was called the Second World War, kind of like that. Huh? It can happen. Huh? So we've forgiven the, the, the Germans. The so Holo Holocaust can happen like that. But uh, that did happen in Vienna. This is, uh, uh, for me, it's a bit, uh, I, I don't have, I have to be honest, I don't have many friends. I don't know how many friends you have, but what I consider friends, I know many people and many people know me here. But uh, together with, it was a few days before Christmas, we, we, we are friendly with a couple since, since years already. And uh, they are educated people too, really educated people, really. And we have been eating and drinking a little, a bottle of wine in a nice place and so on. And then I, I, it came a bit to this subject. I said, I said to him, I said, uh, yeah, Vienna, the, 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 one of the sites of Holocaust. The guy looked up to me and he said, Gerhard, you cannot say something like that. No, this is Vienna. This is uh, not because they're bad or like that. Huh? So just they can't believe it. The, the now the people don't know what is Holocaust. I mean, really, huh? people don't know that. They say they say yes, there have been terrible things happening. But the the problem is you don't learn out of it, huh? and you it's vulnerable. And especially in our days today, huh? we see that in the world, and we see in our Western world, it's it's also fragile. Huh? Democracy is great, but you can elect the dictators huh? if you don't uh, keep your antennas out. But let's be positive. Huh? Let's, let's... <laughs> yeah, let's not go down that road. <laughs> no, that's just, it's a very interesting thing, especially, you know, coming from these days, which is the information age where, you know, anybody like my children's age probably knows about the Holocaust and knows about World War II because there's so much information available. But even when Reed and I were young pups as tour guides, information was came from books and you had to go seek it you had to go look for it so it's interesting because this conversation i wish my children were here to listen to this because they would not believe you <laughs> they'd be like how is that possible you didn't know about world war ii like that's not possible but yeah i mean it is it is true when you think about it that in the past information was held by other people and they could keep it away from you and it's it's a just a fascinating thing to think about i this is not where i thought this conversation was going to go <laughs> it's very interesting <laughs> though <laughs> If, if I can chime yeah, in here too, I just I just have to seize this moment to say, and, and I know Sarah, you're hundred percent on board with this. This is why we travel, though. Look at the way Gerhardt's travels as a young man got him out of the little echo chamber that that exists everywhere. His version was the Vienna echo chamber, and he got outside of that, and he met other people from other lands, and his world got you know, the, his horizons were just exploded and everything changed for him. It changed his whole life. I mean, and that's, that's what happened to me when I was 19 years old and went to Germany the first time. I know it happened to you. And that's, that's why we're true believers to be lucky enough to, to uh, be in the field of travel professionally, because we get this opportunity to expose men, more and more and more people to the fact that there's a big wide world out there. There's more than there's more than one way to look at a problem. There's more than a hundred ways to look at a problem. And I, I just I just had to identify this moment because it's so obvious with Gerhardt's story how his life was changed by travel. So. Well, and I think that that's really relevant to a lot of what we see today with the pro how problematic news sources are, you know, because everybody wants to listen to the news that appeals to them. You know, of course, I, of course, I read The Guardian because that's more my point of view, but other people will want to read, you know, you know, more conservative sort, sorts of sources of news. But what is truth? I mean, at the bottom of it. And that's what travel really pulls away the veil on, I think, is right. that you can actually see so many different flavors of truth, but also come from the source. Um, so it's just such a, it's, I mean, travel as we all agree. If, if you follow me, I'm sure you agree <laughs> that travel is such an incredible um, enriching source, but also I think it's an enriching way to have your personal beliefs challenged in ways that you didn't expect. And Gerhard's story, you are, just, that is such a great story because it's so true. I mean, and you did that at a time when there was no other access to information. Yeah, there would have been, sure, uh, as you say, uh, but 
there was the university libraries libraries and so on but uh i was then in an art in an art university and uh, uh, uh i was like you said before i was hooked on on, on, on also especially Art Nouveau, but I didn't realize that Art Nouveau in Vienna was carried actually by this few Jews, uh, which uh, could make, uh, you could which could make it here in Vienna, which could really make money. Yeah? This was not was only a handful. If ever you seen the movie The Woman in Gold, yes, fiction, it's a Hollywood movie, but uh, The Woman in Gold is a very special uh, movie and and accurate. If you see this point in it, what happened? to the Viennese Jews, which had been ultra rich. What happened to them right after the Anschluss of Austria to Hitler Germany? This is thrilling, thrilling. So what by the way, I, I recommend seeing that movie if before mm -hmm. you come on the cruise with Sarah. And I guarantee if you see that movie on your free afternoon in Vienna, you will go to the Belvedere because the 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 you know that's where all the Gustav Klimt paintings are. The, the whole movie resolves around a Gustav Klimt painting that belonged to a Jewish family that was confiscated from them and then they go through a whole legal proceeding to try to get it back and and the story revolves around that very it's really a worthwhile movie to see before you go to visit vienna as well as the third man if i yeah, and just <laughs> i've been just like googling this as we've been talking so if people who are watching would like to watch those films um it looks like the woman in gold is available on netflix and the other one, the third man is available on Amazon Prime if you have a subscription to that, or you can rent them from Apple. I think Apple has both of them, so. Amazon Prime is free, uh, the, the third man. Yes, yeah, that's that's free. So I have to admit, I've never seen either of those movies. So I know what I'm watching this weekend. That sounds well, lucky really you. you still have, you have two great movies ahead of you. No oh yeah. Blood, no blood, but thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think my kids will want to watch those with me, too, because this is something that they, they have a big interest in World War II. So this would be very uh, enlightening for them. How old are they? Uh, I have a 14-year-old, uh, and I have a son who today is his 18th birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Luca. Happy birthday to Luca. He's in France right now, yes. but he's, he's celebrating oh, with, a, um, with a, a glass of wine and a cigarette today, I hear. <laughs> Very in France. Yeah. Is, 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 is he living there or is it just uh, on he's holiday? Studying. He's studying French. Oh, very, very. Please tell us. Please tell us. He's in Rennes, in Rennes, Rennes in oh, France. Good, good yeah. place. Good place. Great. <laughs> so happy birthday to Luca. I know he's not watching, but. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, so um, I think that that's that's a, such an interesting conversation, and especially your your passion for World War II. What other places do you suggest for people that have an interest in World War II in Vienna? What are the other critical sort of things to see? If yeah, not 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 so much, but uh, of course uh, the Jewish Museum, eh? the Jewish Museum for sure. But it's it focuses. Uh, I don't want to say only, but it focuses on the Jewish aspect. Eh? So that's that's. Uh, limited uh, of course and so uh, like I, I, I in, i'm in this lucky position that i i can uh, show the the wide range so it it comes down to the same it comes down to the to the absolute disaster but uh, but still uh, so like uh, but i would i would recommend the jewish museum only since about six years uh, they have a very good uh, exhibition uh, telling the people what really happened uh, in Vienna and so on. And yeah, wow, they, so they, they, you actually yeah. have a very unique museum in that in that sense that there's just not a lot of other ways to see anything about World War II in Austria. Oh, I love your cat. What's your cat's name? Yeah, yeah this is uh, it's 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 it has many different names. It's, she she's uh, 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 she came from Romania. She had a strong will. You know? She was picked up in Romania. One of these millions of cats there in the streets and uh, and she respects that she likes that and she likes me and my wife for that so, yeah but she's very stubborn very st more stubborn than most of the other cats <laughs> that's exactly only what only what she wants to do but really only that and nothing else if she's in a good mood, you can touch her and kiss her. If she's in a normal mood, don't get near me. <laughs> so if, if, if one of you ever had a cat, this doesn't sound really unfamiliar, isn't it? No, no. Okay. Does not. Yeah, no, I have two, and one of them is exactly that way. She, she has a mind of her own. So 
Um, so I would just like to turn the conversation a little bit to a more kind of dreamy aspect of Vienna, because when I was a student, I, I went there in the 90s and I absolutely loved it. And right, right after I visited Vienna, the movie Before Sunrise came out. And that movie is, I think for me, one of my favorite movies of all time. We're all talking about movies about Vienna. So this is the one I'm gonna add to the list. Uh, and it's about backpackers who meet on a train and they kind of have this romantic evening and they sit around talking about philosophy all night. And what I, I love about it is it really speaks to me a lot about what travel is and, and was when I was a backpacker, when I was a, a kid, you know, it was just about meeting people and having these conversations. You're the first person ever to have this philosophical conversation about Vienna, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so that's kind of the way I think about Vienna is in this a little bit more kind of romantic sort of um, travel way. Um, Reed, what is your kind of romantic vision of the city? What is well, your it, it's, it? it's interesting that you talk about that because one of the signature things about Vienna is the coffee house phenomenon. Yeah. Which, and I'm, I'm connecting that to what you're talking about because that's a, Viennese coffee houses are the place where Viennese people go to read a newspaper, to socialize. It's it's their living room, right? This is a an urban environment where people don't have a lot of living space. So that's their that's their public living room. And it it all goes back to the 17th century. Uh, um, I'll try to keep this short, the, you know, being the historian that I am. Um, Vienna's under siege by the Ottoman Turks, and um, I won't tell the whole story of how they survived that, but one of the heroes was a, a, a man named Kolshitsky, who had been a trader in the Levant and spoke Turkish, and he sort of gathered intelligence, and he also understood that the strange black beans that the Turks left behind when they fled the field were coffee beans, something that was unknown in Europe. And he's the one who started the first coffee house, the Blue Bottle, which became sort of the, the locus of, of any political intrigue over the next couple of hundred years. You know, Lenin would hang out there in the early 20th century. You know, any, any sort of political coup that was being hatched was probably happening at the Blue Bottle or its descendants, which is all those coffee houses in Vienna. So that place where people come together philosophize, talk, visit. That's that's the Viennese coffee house experience. And I've sort of said too much about that, uh, uh, Gerhard, but you you and I have sat and had coffee many, many times in those places. Um, say, say, uh, say a little bit more. I'm, I'm sort of nibbling around the edges. Talk about that Vienna coffee house experience. Yeah, we have to unfortunately also mention that uh, coffee houses, you could sit for hours with a cup of coffee because the male, the real coffee house has a male waiter, not female. If it's female, then it's a cafeteria, then it's a patisseria. So in, in a, it, he only disturbs you when you sit down and then you order, he brings it and that is it. So uh, you could sit a long, long time, read newspapers, uh, watch the others, as you say, uh, a kind of extended living room. But with this, you don't make too much money. So again and again when owners uh, give up when they're old and so on uh, in the central parts of the city uh, then uh, usually supermarkets take over because it's often a large, large space uh, in, in in the city so there are still nice coffee houses but not so much in the center in the center there would be maybe a cafe central uh, or a sacha or like that but this is really totally overrun totally touristic the daimel for example is, is female service but has this excellent pastries and cakes and torts and whatever but it's uh, it's it's not so nice for tourists because it's so many tourists it's part, part, party queuing up in vienna we don't queue up for a coffee uh, we would never do that yeah so i would rather than uh, maybe a little bit outside of the city a little bit out of the city center the, that's the only chance today. But uh, a, a coffee place, which is uh, uh, opposite of the Museum of Applied Arts, which is also one of my favorite, one of my 10 favorite museums. No, but but uh, it's on the ring. Uh, it's the Cafe Brickle, Brickle with, with a P. Uh, and uh, that's still, still, I think, partly female service because it's less expensive there. They, I think the owner says, but, but uh, still it has the coffee house atmosphere. And there would be one uh, on the other side of the ring, but also near to the ring, that's the Sperl, S-P-E-R-L, which is still a coffee house, which has all, it has a, not only newspaper tables, but also you can gamble there, like uh, uh, you can play cards or chess or, or 
pool rule or whatever and you pay per, per hour or so like that they also make an extra money it gives them a special atmosphere also to a coffee place but i like it's, it's since about 15 years or 10 years or whatever people are really not allowed to smoke anymore in coffee places and that makes it so attractive also to go in the morning uh when i when i have uh, a free day and so on, i love to go in the morning and have a good coffee and maybe a, a roll with butter or or, or 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 eggs and so on and it's so great huh? because the the aroma and the air and so on and, uh, it's nice coffee house is uh, is a very special great invention and it's celebrated in Vienna. it's celebrated so do you tend to go there and have long long conversations with people discuss philosophy no. as no, we no, might no, imagine I, I, Exactly the opposite. I, I want to be completely undisturbed. When I'm, I'm usually not going alone. But if I'm going alone, I'm sitting uh, with, my, with my back to the to the place. I'm, uh, I, I don't want to, because I'm not I'm, I'm not well known in Vienna. But many people do know me, and uh, I, I I really don't like this, uh, you know, this kind of conversations. Ah, long time I didn't see you, and so on. How are you? And so on. this is really, ah, I think my goodness. Uh, the well, next time I don't go to this coffee house anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't want people to talk to you. <laughs> I, I'm oh, a God. tour guide, I have a museum and so on. Uh, uh, and I don't like, it's not like that. Uh, I, 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 I love people which have a reason to be together with me or the other way around. This is fantastic. But not, I, can you imagine you're a famous person and you go on the street and everybody looks at you and has, has no clue who, who you are. And, and gives you silly questions. Ah, I think this must be horrible. <laughs> Famous for other people. So yeah. keeping with your theme though, Sarah, of sort of romantic things, romantic places. Um, when, when back at the beginning, and you might not have been with us at the time, uh, Gerhardt was talking about how easy it is to get out of the center. Everything is, is close together in the center, all the historic sites, all the fun things everything's very close together but but very quickly you can jump on a tram and get out of the city and up to the vienna woods right the wiener vault famous wiener vault the vienna woods and it's it sweeps up the hillside there and you can look back over all of vienna and they've got a little something up there called hoiriges right these are um vineyards where they've made a little i'm going to call it a cafe cafeteria style um, and people, Viennese people themselves like to get out of the city, go up, have a glass of wine, have some dinner. Um, it's not, it's not elegant. It's more pub, pub feeling to me. Um, Gerhard, you can jump in and correct me at any moment here, but it's, it's very just like very casual, very casual. Yeah, very casual, and, but, but genuinely Viennese, right? Not, I mean, of course there are touristy Hoerigas just like there are coffee houses that have become touristy, but it still is something that's ge a genuine Viennese thing to do, right? To go to a Hoyriga, have some radishes or um, schmaltz on a roll. You know, I, by the way, schmaltz is a real thing, <laughs> right? That's that's a, a slang word at home, but it's it's actually a real thing that you spread on bread in Vienna. Um, hey, uh, Gerhard, take take it away. What's what's your feeling about Hoyrigas, and and have I done a fair job? Talking about them. I oh, know you 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 do well, but you could also, for example, from at the upper opera house, uh, opposite the opera house, there's a streetcar, uh, 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 and it goes uh, till uh, till the final stop, and that's a town, one of the nice towns around the, the city. That's Baden. It's called Baden. It's a spa resort, but it's very easy, very nice. It's, the the streetcar stops right in this nice pedestrian zone. There's a fantastic park. And uh, and around there is loads of vineyards and lots of these wineries which sell the wine which is created in with the grapes of their in, in of their own vineyard and often you sit in this in these vineyards and you drink the wine and uh, food from the region so mainly cold food you know, because then they don't need a restaurant license it's all it's all very very it's it's special it's it's really nice. Uh, when, when you see the, the aroma of the uh, nice long summer evenings of Vienna uh, has a very good climate uh, since about 20 years. Uh, the climate change affected Vienna positively very long summers. And and then the aroma of the wine and of this uh, simple but good food, uh, which goes with wine. There's a buffet you can uh, take to, to your little table, whatever you want. No, it's it's it has atmosphere and music. It often has music, right? So, mm -hmm. But this kind of 
maybe second class or maybe third class music, but still it's it's fun. Uh, violin players or harmonica players, or they 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 entertain a little bit. Huh? But this the the real Viennese organ, they are usually a little bit. It's all uh, starting with uh, the song starting with cemetery, cemetery, and ending with cemetery, cemetery. Like let's have one more one more glass of wine before the lid closes and this kind of stuff. But it's uh, it's, it's it, this is romantic for Vienna. That's so. the most German thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that was that was a new one for me. I have to say. But, but, but if you like it romantic, that's uh, Viennese uh, rom romance <laughs> kind of. That's what we like. We like that. Hey, hey Gerhard, when we come at the end, when Sarah comes with the group at the end of September, is it good? Is it too early for Sturm, or are they going to have? No, no, no. It's 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 already a good time for Sturm. Oh, it's... I'm so glad. That's that... yeah. tell tell us about that. That's such a Viennese thing. Yeah, it's 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 the wine when it's not uh it it it, it it's not completely fermented yet, huh? so it's uh quite a bit cloudy and uh, it's sweet. And uh, uh, it's called Sturm because it's uh, still working. It's, it's, uh, but uh, if you drink uh, maybe three, four glasses because it's, you think it's just sweet and it's not no alcohol, and so then, you, then you get the, the, the Sturm, you know, the Sturm uh, right into your stomach and into your intestines. You know? So be so careful. For, for our yeah. viewers, Sturm means storm in German. Yeah. So. <laughs> storm storm in your stomach and you really have to be lucky if you can reach the toilet and it's not a, a, another unfortunate person blocking the toilet because experiencing the storm in the in the stomach then that's then a disaster but you're making you're, it sound really attractive <laughs> Oh, it really is, but, but but I can I can attest it it's dangerous stuff because it goes down so easy it's like drinking grape juice but it is fermented exactly. enough that, that exactly. a couple glasses you'll feel it. It's it's a little dangerous. <laughs> dangerous to make you drunk. Right. Or dangerous to make you need need the toilet really fast. <laughs> That's another new angle. Uh, and, and as always, when we have Gerhard on, we're learning things we've never heard before. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> we're all about learning here. <laughs> Well, my friends, uh, I can't believe it, but it's been almost an hour. I, that was like the fastest conversation I think I've had in a long time. So it has been an absolute delight to have you, Gerhard. I've really enjoyed chatting with you today. And I can't wait to bring a group to see you. Uh, that's going to be the end of September next year in 2023. And we'll go to your museum. And I'd love to go and drink some storm with you. And I'll bring some like Imodium with me also, it sounds like. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and I, I want to make my plug here that that now you see why we always want Gerhardt, because you're going to get more than just facts and dates and history. I mean, there's always going to be some added level of spontaneous entertainment from this guy. So uh, thanks for coming on, Gerhardt, and giving us a taste of, of being with you in Vienna, which to me, being with you is, is another one of those marquee things about Vienna. So thanks so much. I would say that about you also, Reed. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and maybe also me, that's kind of our thing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you too, and uh, thank, uh, thanks really also to all the listeners which uh, did not uh, leave already uh, the program. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Oh, I'm, no, I'm <laughs> yeah, thanks for bye everybody bye. Sticking, sticking by. So thank you so much to, uh, to Gerhard, and thank you again to Reed as usual for um, a great conversation today. Just as a little side note, all of our conversations are being converted into a podcast. So you'll find that on Spotify, you'll find it on Apple Podcasts, and it's called um, Drinks with Sarah. And it's just uh, basically the transcripts or the, the audio recordings of all of these conversations we've had over the past what three years now I guess um, so lots to listen to if you want to listen to us and babble away on uh, while you take a walk on your on your headphones so uh, thanks so much for joining us again if you want to check out that um, tour it's at imprinttours.com and it's the Danube River Cruise that I will be on uh, and it's going to be great we're going to eat lots of strudel and drink coffee it's going to be great right <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot everybody we'll see you again later ciao ciao All right. bye Alvito Zane.